Good afternoon, everybody. We're delighted to have you here. My name is John Hamry. I'm the president at CSIS, and it's a great opportunity to welcome back to CSIS Ernie Moniz. Uh, Ernie, of course, was uh, when he was Secretary of Energy, was very active with us, and we were very grateful to have had him come in many dimensions. He would come and talk about oil and gas. He would come and talk about nuclear energy, power, commercial nuclear energy. And he would come and talk with us about, about uh, nuclear weapons. But uh, we're lucky now to have him still staying in town, still staying active. And of course, he's become the co-chair uh, of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. My old boss, Senator Sam Nunn, uh, is uh, the co-chair with him. And I'm delighted, Senator, that you're back today. I asked if he wanted to say any remarks. He said, oh, hell no. He said, I'm going to let Ernie do that. You know, you know, he's, well, he <laughs> he's going to, yeah, he may rebut what Ernie says. I don't know. We'll find out. Charlie Curtis, thank you for being here. Charlie uh, and Deb, thank you for being here. Uh, NTI has been partners with us in raising so many of the important issues of our, of our day. Just as a, a bit of a safety announcement first in case uh, we may hear a voice that comes and says we have an emergency. If that happens, please follow my instructions. We've got an exit right here and right over there that'll take us down to the street. We'll go down, we'll take two left-hand turns once we get out onto the alley and meet over at National, uh, National Geographic, and by then I will have hot chocolate ready for you, so we'll be ready. Nothing's going to happen, but I just want you to know, follow my instructions if, if we need to do anything. Um, we, I don't think we ever had a more qualified individual to be Secretary of Energy than Ernie Moniz. Uh, Ernie was a kind of the, if you could design someone who was perfect for that job, it was Ernie. He, he knew government well. He knew the private sector very well. He had the honesty and the objectivity of being in academia where he could reflect on what he saw both in government and in the private sector. And he, he brought to the job just enormous energy. Uh, and I, I look back and say, those were really golden years for us. And of course, he was working through a series of pretty tough issues uh, at the time. And uh, those issues haven't gone away. I, I hope today that we may have an opportunity to hear a little bit about Iran, maybe a little bit about North Korea. Uh, with any luck at all, you're going to be, you're going to find this a fascinating afternoon. And let me just say, Brent Scowcroft, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Anytime Brent comes, I know we've got a great meeting. Thank you, Brent. So now add a little bit more of that applause and welcome Ernie Moniz. Thank you, John. Although, uh, I thought you were going to say that the emergency announcement might be coming tomorrow, uh, but that's maybe something we'll touch on uh, uh, later on. Uh, but uh, I really appreciate the chance to be back here at CSIS, uh, which has been such an effective and, and respected organization, um, uh, in not, and recognized, of course, the here and uh, globally uh, in, that, in, that, in that way. Uh, and uh, of course, CSIS has had very close ties with, with Sam, Sam Nunn, uh, who you already introduced. And Sam, obviously, an enormous leader in nuclear security, uh, but a great friend and colleague. Uh, and I now have the privilege of partnering with him uh, on a routine basis at, uh, uh, at NTI and, uh, and uh, work with him in trying to reduce uh, nuclear and other global, global security threats. Uh, at, uh, at NTI, which he founded in 2001, along with, uh, along with Ted Turner. And uh, Sam, uh, I can assure you, remains an extraordinary source of, of wisdom, so that's great. I have to add, uh, Brent Scowcroft, since you mentioned uh, being a DUE, and Brent was one of the introducers uh, for my nomination, uh, apparently with great sway uh, in, the, uh, in the Senate, uh, given, given the results. But uh, I really, uh, Brent's another great, great friend, and I have the pleasure in a different role of roaming around the same floor with Brent Scowcroft also uh, quite a few times uh, uh, each week. And I'll just, I will mention Charlie Curtis uh, with whom, uh, again, a, a very, very long association in government and Charlie has dragged himself out of retirement to help, um, help us in this, uh, uh, these first, uh, first periods at, uh, at um, NTI. So, you know, uh, last month uh, I had the uh, pleasure of speaking in, at the University of Chicago uh, it was the uh, 75th anniversary of Enrico Fermi's uh, first controlled chain reaction. 
Uh, and that really was the launching of the nuclear age and the, really the precursor to the, to the Manhattan Project, uh, which had already started technically, but uh, his, his work was, was critical uh, for the Manhattan Project that, of course, developed the first nuclear weapons. Uh, at that time, as people in this audience uh, almost certainly know, it, it was already recognized uh, at that time, the dual nature of, of, this, uh, of this technology. Uh, that on the one hand, uh, the potential that was realized, of course, uh, to make weapons uh, that are uh, quite different from other instruments of war in their destructive power, but also technology that could have many beneficial applications. Uh, energy was clearly there from, from the very beginning, but then medicine, industrial applications, uh, et cetera. Uh, so this duality is something that we've been facing right from the beginning of, of the nuclear age. And is that dual duality, the fact that those, both of those applications really, uh, really draw from a common technology base that, uh, that has challenged uh, both governments and, and international institutions. So um, uh, I've been focusing on this certainly personally for, for about four decades and, and certainly am committed to extending what I think has been NTI's uh, outstanding work uh, along with Sam and a terrific staff and, and the broader national security community, uh, John, Brent, and others uh, who are in this room. Now, if judged only by the metrics that nuclear weapons have not been used since 1945, that nuclear energy provides about a sixth of global electricity, uh, that nuclear medicine uh, saves countless lives, uh, we can say that uh, we've enjoyed the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, uh, of nuclear technology, while avoiding the use of a nuclear weapon uh, since, uh, since, since World War II. But that said, uh, I think we've had too many close calls. Uh, with uh, nuclear weapons, uh, and the number of nuclear weapon states uh, has, has, of course, grown. So today, uh, now in the 21st century, we're challenged uh, by a different nuclear age, and there are so many dimensions of that. First, I want to say that miscalculation, and I will be using miscalculation throughout this speech in a, as kind of a broad bucket for accident, mistake, miscalculation, catastrophic terrorism. So miscalculation, uh, uh, in my view, uh, is the most likely catalyst of nuclear use. Uh, even though deterrence remains paramount, it's not enough. Secondly, the sophistication of, the North, of North Korea's nuclear weapons program cannot be denied. Third, there are advocates in both Russia and the United States for using or threatening to use nuclear weapons in a number of scenarios. The concept of escalate to de-escalate de continues to make the rounds in Moscow, and last month's U.S. national security strategy expanded the role of nuclear weapons, at least apparently deeming them, quotes, essential to prevent nuclear attack, non-strategic attacks, and large-scale conventional aggression. 9-11 her heralded an age of terrorism uh, with, with global reach, unconstrained by notions of deterrence, and nuclear power and nuclear fuel cycle capabilities are spreading, including in regions rife with rivalries and conflicts. It's really quite a, quite a different set of boundary conditions that we have to think about uh, in, in going forward, which obviously calls for re-examining uh, strategic policies and near-term decisions uh, on the U.S. nuclear arsenal, force postures, doctrine, uh, and the like. We also need to examine our response to international challenges, like Iran and North Korea, as well as the dangerous state of U.S.-Russia relations. We must not unnecessarily convert significant diplomatic challenges into security crises, as seems to be happening today with Iran and North Korea. I should say, we will post a, um, a, a version of these remarks, a longer version of these remarks uh, at NTI. Um, uh, but to, so today, I'm just going to start the conversation that we will be having with John and with you uh, with five broad messages and then a few remarks on the issues uh, du jour, uh, Iran and North Korea. So these five points I'd like to make. First, the combination of advances in technology tensions between nations, terrorism and cyber dangers must challenge traditional thinking about nuclear weapons policies, the risk of nuclear weapons use, the configuration and deployment of our forces and the priorities of our investments. Maintaining a safe, secure and reliable deterrent is necessary in today's world, but it is not sufficient. The risks of miscalculation should be at the forefront of our thinking and an important driver of our analyses. Second, 
preventing nuclear use is the core objective of our nuclear policy. Specifically, when the nuclear posture review surfaces, presumably in a few weeks, we need to assess its recommendations in part by considering whether they lessen the dangers of miscalculation and thereby increase stability and reduce the risk of nuclear use or not. If the recently released national security strategy is a guide, as I, as I said earlier, uh, we could be heading in the wrong direction. I think school is out. We'll see what the, what the NPR says. But expanding the types of threats against which nuclear weapons might be used under the banner of deterrence likely will make the risks of miscalculation greater, not less. For those who argue that the U.S. needs more usable nuclear options to enhance deterrence, they have a high burden to explain why the present options are insufficient. The President already has options for flexibly employing the nuclear deterrent. By what logic should we stress that deploying more usable weapons against the backdrop of our current flexible nuclear capability and our conventional military capabilities that remain second to none, how does it make it less likely that they will be used? By what logic can we count on a nuclear exchange to remain limited? Is the full range of cyber threats to nuclear weapons command and control being addressed in a way that provides confidence under scenarios with very short decision time? Are we, ab are we about to join those in Russia who declare that we need to be prepared to escalate to de-escalate? What happens if the world's nuclear superpowers start down this road? So these are questions, but the kinds of questions that I think we need to be hard-nosed in, uh, uh, in examining uh, the, the NPR. Third United States and Russia have divergent interests in many areas. Russia's intrusion in Ukraine, its backing of the genocidal regime in Syria, tampering with our election, have obviously increased tensions. The uncertain outcome of the Mueller investigation is also a factor. Nevertheless, we remain convinced that we must find a way to resume a strategic relationship and regularize dialogue with Russia on matters of existential common interest to include the cyber dangers crisis management of our conventional and nuclear forces, terrorist acquisition of nuclear materials and weapons, and more. Not as a favor to Russia. We did this at the height of the Cold War. We must do it again. To support this national security imperative, we must forge a bipartisan joint Congress administration approach to security issues with Russia, especially now that last year's sanctions legislation puts in place shared executive branch and congressional decision making. Sam and I have specifically recommended a liaison group of congressional, State Department, and Department of Defense leadership similar in spirit to that formed around arms control issues during the Reagan administration. Fourth, the International Atomic Energy Agency's 20th century nuclear fuels safeguards architecture need strengthening in the 21st century. The IAEA is doing a very good job in monitoring Iran's compliance with the JCPOA, using the array of new verification tools provided by that agreement. Indeed, verification is really the heart of the JCPOA, and it does not sunset. Over time, we may be able to consider evolving the JCPOA verification regime to more nearly universal application. And fifth, we must make worldwide progress in developing comprehensive, commercially-based, advanced nuclear fuels services, including fuel supply, waste storage, and disposition. Without this progress, additional, quotes, Irans are likely to present themselves in the future. So let me just make a few comments now about Iran and then a few on North Korea. On Iran, we're obviously on the precipice of a new crisis in Iran if the President refuses to approve the sanctions waivers, and it's the United States, not Iran, that fails to meet its commitments under the deal. <clears throat> the Iran nuclear deal puts a straight jacket on Iran's nuclear activities. Discussion of the J JCPOA, however, typically misses its most important features, such as the 15-year limitation that is until January 2031 during which Iran can have more, no more than 300 kilograms of uranium enriched up to 3.67%. This is a very, very tight constraint. 
and then the enduring verification measures covering every stage of Iran's nuclear activities. That is what's often missed, and it deserves repeating. The real heart of the JCPOA is in its unprecedented international verification provisions. It's based on verification, not trust. It's ironic that with the JCPOA, Iran has the toughest constraints on its nuclear program of any nation on the planet and the most demanding verification regime. Yet the president may take action imminently to remove these constraints with no viable alternative. Opponents of the deal are fixated on those provisions in the deal that sunset. They underplay or simply ignore the importance of the commitments that don't expire a permanent prohibition on Iran having a nuclear weapon, or a weaponization program, which is unique, permanent adherence to the additional protocol with a unique time window to respond to IAEA inspection requests for undeclared sites, again, unique, and the requirement to ship out all spent fuel for the life of the redesigned Iraq reactor, which I remind you was the heart of the plutonium pathway that caused a lot of uh, const consternation. Yet we hear that 15 years is, and I'm derided at, at uh, NTI for this, epsilon uh, compared to the history of the Persian Empire. Well, that's a fact, uh, but it's entirely manufactured as an objection to the agreement. Uh, 15 years is a significant period in the political life of a country, and Iran, in fact, is demonstrating that uh, with these widespread protests that shine light on the government's failure to adequately serve the people's needs. The nuclear deal was never meant to be the end of the road in our engagement with Iran. We, along with our partners in the JCPOA, should be using this time to build on the agreement to help shape the outcome when the nuclear constraints uh, uh, lift, which so far we have done very little uh, of as we approach in five days the two-year mark of the agreement implementation. Our European partners are stressing this, the foundational nature of the JCPOA, and with the nuclear agreement in place, we can and should be taking action to address Iran's support for terrorism, the Syrian regime and its regional proxies, the human rights record, and other troubling aspects of Iranian policy without the complications of the, of the nuclear issue. We should keep the spotlight on the internal failings of Iranian governance and the country's economic situation, indeed turning up the heat on these issues with our European and regional friends and allies is essential and reinforces the failings pointed out uh, in the recent protests. Iran needs to respond to popular demands for more rapid modernization. With the JCPOA, Iran's leadership cannot easily blame their governance and economic shortcomings on the United States and external forces. We should not give leverage to the most extreme elements in Iran by unilaterally withdrawing from the JCPOA. We must also draw lessons from the JCPOA for broader fuel cycle considerations. As we look ahead a few years, we are likely to confront more Iran-like circumstances unless we can build verification enhancements to fuel cycle management globally and develop better solutions for fuel and waste services. Advances in technologies and technology are making weapons capabilities easier to acquire under a safeguards regime that can and should be strengthened to fully meet its purpose. The slow but steady expansion of interest in nuclear reactors internationally and the uncertainty surrounding the future of U.S. nuclear power are making it more important than ever to identify, incentivize, and implement an approach to fuel services that reinforces key nonproliferation and nuclear security principles. Such an approach should support reliable, an economical commercial fuel market, minimize the spread of uranium enrichment capacity, and address the management of irradiated fuel in ways that don't lead to steadily increasing uh, stockpiles of separated plutonium. Most important, all these approaches must be backstopped with international safeguards and monitoring systems that take advantage of technological progress and have the political and financial resources to back them up. At NTI, we are expanding uh, substantially our efforts in this area, and we'll be seeking to work with public and private partners to operationalize such an approach so that countries can have the benefits of peaceful nuclear technologies without increasing proliferation dangers. The IAEA-LEU Bank 
that uh, NTI catalyzed uh, over a decade ago is a foundational step, for example, in that direction. As a CSIS commission concluded several years ago, and my colleagues and I affirmed and expanded on last year, a diminishing American nuclear technology supply chain is a national security concern, both for our standing in maintaining and expanding stringent nonproliferation norms and for meeting our own national security requirements. So there's a big effort here on the fuel cycle that will be critical if we want to reach our ultimate goals uh, in the nuclear security arena. Finally, let me just add a few words on North Korea. Uh, while the threat has been growing, the President's war of words has managed to unsettle our allies and alarm the rest of the world. Blurring the historic recognition that nuclear weapons have destructive power of a different order of magnitude than the most powerful conventional weapons. In fact, I might just add, I'd like to make a comparison. The Oklahoma City bomb of big Ryder truck was about two tons of TNT equivalent versus the four orders of magnitude larger blasts of the World War II bombs, not to mention the additional radiation issues uh, involved with, with nuclear weapons. So uh, this cannot be talked about in anything <laughs> resembling uh, this, this, the, same, the same way. Of course, Kim Jong-un has now taken the diplomatic initiative with his outreach to the South and Pyongyang's participation in the upcoming uh, Winter Olympics. Now, we've been living for some time with the threat of a nuclear North Korea, and that could strike, that, that could strike U.S. allies and our forces uh, in the Asia-Pacific region. Under Kim Jong-un, the nuclear and missile threat has become more acute as North Korea has systematically advanced its nuclear and missile technology. We have to stop thinking about that, those tests as provocations as opposed to a systematic and increasingly successful um, uh, development of those, of those technologies. Now, there would be a significant benefit to our security, uh, uh, us, the U.S. and our allies, uh, and a reduction in regional tensions if we can convince the North, obviously, to pause and then perhaps forego uh, any further testing uh, of weapons uh, and long-range ballistic missiles. But there is not a long time to capture the benefits of such a pause. More likely than not, achieving that outcome will require direct talks with the North Koreans on the path to negotiations. Whether there, whether there is now an opening for such talks is not clear. Some believe Kim Jong-un's New Year's Day claim that the, quotes power and reliability of nuclear warheads and ballistic missiles have already been proved to the full, close quote, opens the door to a freeze on nuclear and long-range ballistic missile tests. We need to find a way to probe the North Koreans on that point and, of course, exploit it if, in fact, there is one. It's also imperative that we focus now on additional steps to reduce the risks of miscalculation on the Korean Peninsula, including first and foremost the risk of nuclear use, but also use of devastating conventional forces on both sides of the 38th parallel. Unlike in Iran, where it made sense to keep the negotiations confined to the nuclear program, in order to prevent nuclear weapons development, negotiations with Pyongyang must address broader issues beyond their declared nuclear deterrent. For talks to succeed, the United States and China must first share a vision of the ultimate goal, the political, economic, and security arrangements that can form the foundation of a more stable Korean peninsula. That shared vision with Beijing must be built on a strong foundation and framework of consultations between the United States, South Korea, and Japan, and other key parties like Russia. We must be prepared to engage Beijing on its, its real security concerns. And there are tough questions. Reunification of the Korean Peninsula is not an obtainable goal for the foreseeable future. How does that play in? The future regional posture of the US military forces is a critical piece of the puzzle. There is little public evidence, at least, that sufficiently encompassing discussions of this type have taken place. In concluding, there's no doubt the United States continues with a unique responsibility and imperative to lead and set the right course. The nuclear policy and posture Washington sets in the coming weeks, actually days and weeks, will determine America's path for the next years 
and decisions on Russia, Iran, and the DPRK potentially for decades. Since the NPT, the, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, entered into force, eight American presidents, both parties, have reaffirmed our legal obligation to work with other nuclear weapon states to divest themselves of nuclear weapons over time. It's essential that the NPR back that up with practical, concrete steps toward achieving that goal. The best way to reduce and eliminate the risk of miscalculation and nuclear use, of course, is to work steadily to define and then walk the long, tortuous path to eliminating nuclear weapons. And there's a lot of headroom for creative diplomacy. Thank you. Wow, Ernie, uh, you've given us an, uh, a lot of wonderful material uh, to kind of guide us with our thoughts today. I'm going to spend a little bit of time to ask some questions, and I'm going to count on all of you to uh, really bring the meeting alive here. Uh, you, you mentioned several times the Nuclear Posture Review. Um, I think the question largely that, we'll, that we're waiting to hear is this discussion, does the Russian development of micro-nuclear weapons uh, require us to build comparable weapons for deterrence? What do you think about that question? Well, first of all, let me uh, repeat the four orders of magnitude, because micro in this context <laughs> has to be remembered uh, as uh, <laughs> still a nuclear weapon, right? Uh, uh, number one. Uh, uh, number two, as, as, I, as I said, the, um, I think the test uh, is, uh, is there a convinced, I mean, if, the, I mean, I don't know what's in the NPR, but, you know, but if, if there's something that, that goes in that direction, then I would hope there is the sufficient uh, analysis, uh, analysis-backed uh, statement as to why this contributes to stability, why it uh, reduces the possibility of use. Um, I have not seen that argument made convincingly at all. Um, uh, we have a flexible uh, uh, deterrent, as I've, as I've, as I've, as I've emphasized. Uh, uh, I think there are many ways of, of, rep of repositioning it, perhaps. Um, but again, so John, my answer is, uh, I'm, I'm open to hearing an argument that I have not yet heard uh, yeah. to, uh, to, to convince me that that's, that's a, a positive yeah. path. Yeah, I mean, the, traditionally we've said in this country, you know, we don't want to build a warhead that's, that we want to use. But what happens if we think our opponent is building a warhead that is usable? I think that, that become, that's going to be a major sure. debate we're going to have in the country. Like you, I think it, we need to see I, the proposal. We need to see the analysis. I think it, is, it has to be made very, very clear. We have a deterrent against the use of any nuclear weapon against mm -hmm. us or our allies. Yeah. Uh, you said something that I, and I must admit, I have to admit my failing to not have appreciated this before, which was that the verification uh, agreement with Iran in Jikpoa is eternal. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Uh, would you amplify? On, 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 on verification. On verification. Yeah. Uh, would you amplify on that? I don't think yeah. many Americans really caught that. So the... Um, uh, first of all, there's a, there's a layered set of, of verification measures, uh, for example, uh, and all of which are completely unique to, uh, to Iran. In fact, let me preface that by saying that in the negotiation, uh, well, when, or at least when uh, Dr. Salehi, uh, head of their nuclear program, and I uh, were brought into the negotiation in parallel with the, with the, uh, with the foreign ministers, John Kerry and, and, and Zarif, uh, that really early on we ha had to establish there's no argument over whether or not the international community has a high degree of distrust of the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, the facts on the ground uh, t tell you that. Uh, the fact that the U.S. and Russia post-Ukraine were negotiating together tells you that. The point of that is that therefore right up front it was, had to be made clear 
there would need to be extraordinary verification measures for there to be any hope mm. of an acceptable agreement. Okay? So then there are a whole variety of things, and I mentioned, for example, 20 years of uh, surveillance of the manufacture of critical centrifuge parts, 25 years of uh, uranium supply chain verification. But now getting to some forever stuff, the uh, Iran is, commits to the additional protocol for those who are not familiar, probably few in this audience, but the additional protocol is what gives the IAEA uh, the opportunity to inspect undeclared nuclear sites uh, that, for which they have reason to be suspicious. Uh, that is a voluntary agreement with various countries. Iran is required to be in the additional protocol forever, but there's even more. With the additional protocol, the voluntary additional protocol, as, as it is exercised now with any other country, there is no time limit. The IAE says, I think that facility, let me make it clear, which could be a military facility, um, gives us pause and we have some reasons. Great. There's no time limit for when the access is actually granted. In the Iran agreement, there is. There's a 14-day period in which Iran and the IAEA must work out the terms of the access. If they cannot reach those terms in 14 days, there's 10 more days for the access to happen, or they are in violation of the JCPOA. This is a very, very powerful uh, constraint. And uh, it's almost never mentioned uh, in, in the discussion, uh, number one. And number two, imagine that's the kind of constraint we would give up if we were to unilaterally walk away from this agreement uh, while Iran is complying. What, if, if, if we were to walk away from JICPOA, what will the other negotiating parties do? You know, I, I, don't, I don't know, John, it's hard to speculate, but uh, I think the, well, obviously, there are, let's say, two different ex example scenarios. One scenario, obviously, is, is Iran says, okay, deal is done, uh, and uh, we, will, um, we will resume our nuclear activities uh, uh, as we wish. No 300 kilogram limit, no, no centrifuge limit, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then the question would become, would we be able, having been the ones to precipitate the, the, the failure, would we be able to once again marshal mm -hmm. the international community for a serious sanctions regime? Mm -hmm. uh, I doubt we would reach the one that we had before, but mm -hmm. that, that, would be, that would be the issue. The other, another scenario, and there are others obviously, but another scenario is that Iran and the other uh, the, uh, the three European countries, uh, the EU, China, and Russia, all agree to proceed with the agreement, but recognizing that this is voluntary. Okay, we will voluntarily do this with our friends. Well, one thing is, of course, we've managed to isolate ourselves completely, mm -hmm. to have no seat at the table, no seat uh, with the Joint Commission, no seat with the pro another thing which is unique, a procurement channel, so that any dual use items ha have to go through a process with the, with the P5 uh, plus one. Uh, the, uh, um, we're isolated, and then I think there is a real issue, how religiously would a voluntary agreement be pursued or followed over time, uh, and with, as erosion could, could be setting in, especially because the verification measures are unique, right? And as an aside, if I may answer a question you didn't ask, uh, but, but I, I alluded to it uh, obliquely, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's one reason why one of the many threads that we want to pursue in looking at the nuclear fuel cycle globally is a thread of 
can we get some of those verification measures adopted voluntarily by other countries? They would greatly strengthen the, gl the global safeguards regime and would frankly put some pressure on Iran, in fact, to continue, continue uh, with, its, uh, with, its, uh, with its program. Several times you, in your speech and just now, you've talked about the role that uh, uh, commercial nuclear energy plays as an indispensable kind of dimension of uh, a proliferation control regime. And Russia has become such a major supplier and participant in this global system. Uh, you mentioned that we've got to find ways to work together. This is a pretty tough right now where there's such hostility. Is there a window, from your conversations with Russians, is there a window of uh, possibility to discuss uh, nuclear safeguards, nuclear control, fuse, fuel cycle? Is that it all in the realm of a something we could talk constructively with Russia about these days, assuming we wanted to? I think uh, it would be very, very, very difficult. I think there's, there are many things that we can and should discuss with Russia. Uh, I'll give you an example, um, by the way, of something that occurred last uh, May uh, with N NTI. It was a catalyst for a meeting uh, with the uh, Department of Energy, uh, Rosatom from Russia, mm -hmm. IAEA, uh, and the Central Asian Republics, the meeting was in Kazakhstan, to discuss the issue of dirty bombs uh, and how one might secure, first of all, identify, uh, secure, and eventually replace uh, things like medical sources that could be used as, as dirty bomb materials. So that's something of clear mutual interest no. in a part of the world for which one should be concerned about, about this kind of thing. So there's a whole string of things that, that we can be discussing right, right now with them that involve nuclear security. I think right now, frankly, until uh, we get past um, our, our significant problems uh, between US and Russia right now, uh, I think commercial power would be very, very tough. But I, what I can say is going back to when, frankly, when I was undersecretary in the Clinton years, and all the way through up to, up to, up to Ukraine, uh, that was the area the Russians really wanted to collaborate with us on, mm -hmm. uh, com the commercial fuel cycle. Uh, and we certainly had lots of complementary uh, skill sets and capabilities uh, that, we could have, that, that we could draw on. Uh, frankly, uh, <laughs> this is one of those things that's an irrelevant uh, footnote of history, but uh, I, I can again use Epsilon. We were within Epsilon of getting a terrific agreement uh, done. Uh, <laughs> Sam, I got it again. Uh, the, uh, 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 done at the end of the Clinton administration, but anyway, it didn't work and, uh, and, um, mm -hmm. and it's unfortunate. It would have had all of these elements of fuel cycle and fuel services that we've been trying to, trying to advocate for. <laughs> Let me spin the globe and put our finger on Korean Peninsula. Um, this is obviously a dangerous situation. Um, North Korea has had nuclear weapons now for 10 years. They're developing much more sophisticated delivery capabilities. Uh, candidly, our allies, South Korea and Japan, are questioning whether extended deterrence represents a real guarantee any longer. Um, they won't say it during the first round of drinks. It usually takes several rounds of drinks before you get to it, but they will at some point say, you know, we probably need to have our own retaliatory capability. What, you just put you back in office, what are you, what would you be saying to our allies about the confidence they ought to have in us? First of all, what I would not be saying is that the, especially at the current level of development of long range, I mean, intercontinental uh, ballistic missile uh, technology, uh, uh, and, and I mean by, by what I mean right now at least is that I'm certainly one of those who does not believe that there is the capability for an integrated system to actually deliver uh, the package uh, effectively. Uh, over long distances. 
But what I would not be saying is that this is the game changer because they have to be, we have to assume they have the capability right now, and they've had the capability to deliver those weapons uh, in much shorter range missiles that certainly threaten <laughs> South Korea and Japan, uh, not to mention all of our own military uh, families and, uh, and, and the like uh, who are there. So uh, I can't say that I, that I, I find the dialogue uh, has, having been terribly uh, well thought through uh, up to now. Uh, then uh, with regard to what one would say, uh, uh, I, I think it's the framework that I, again, I alluded to briefly, that uh, we, need to, we need to have much broader security discussions with Korea, Japan, and South Korea, Japan, and, and China in particular to scope out what is the kind of acceptable security structure for them and then presumably for North Korea uh, because I, I think that we're going to have to have a real step-by-step -step march through talks before we get to negotiations, mm. which will have to be multilateral. And I don't think we have that security posture mapped out for the, for the entire region. Mm. Do you think that we could just simply count on deterrence to handle North Korea? Well, Look, we are in, we are, we, whether we want to say it or not, we are in a deterrence posture, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I certainly do not think we should give up on uh, the vision of a nuclear-free mm -hmm. uh, peninsula, but that's going to be a long yeah. haul. Uh, and so we better get used to thinking about how, how we're going to manage uh, now, certainly a military, a military solution, quote, solution at the moment uh, uh, looks like, in fact, Secretary Mattis has said that. I mean, that it looks to be a horrible, <laughs> a horrible option. So I think it's a question of, uh, of, num of, of, first of all, really enforcing sanctions that are already on the books, mm -hmm. yep. which again, I think can't happen without that bigger condominium in terms of the security architecture. Uh, and. Uh, 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 and, and then, then, then that's how one, how one moves forward, I think. Okay, uh, colleagues, let me turn to all I'm of sorry. you. And I think I'll just say yeah, that, please. and by the way, and Sig Hecker, uh, who a lot of people in this room know, is, of course, is a great expert in this, and, uh, and, uh, and we just had a discussion recently, and uh, Sig is really working up some very interesting analytics that reinforce this case that the buildup of the North Korean weapon, nuclear weapons and, and, uh, and missile capabilities has been, you know, a quarter century, yeah, yeah, <laughs> pretty yeah, much yeah, yeah, yeah. steady march towards these capabilities yeah. with maybe some acceleration under the current national leader. Uh, and the corollary to that is you don't unwind that very quickly either. So we, we, I think we need, to, we need to think of the long game here uh, with no nuclear use and no major conventional use, of course, uh, uh, at the 38th parallel uh, as, 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 the, as, the, as the long game going through deterrence to eventual, hopefully, um, re rejoining of North Korea with the international community and, and uh, denuclearization. Okay, I'm gonna ask a question. Uh, identify yourself, no long questions. I'll cut you off ruthlessly and make fun of you if you do a long question. Right here in the third from the back. Please identify yourself and stand up just so we can see. Uh, hi, Dr. Mons, thank you very much for your remarks and your work. My name is Dmitry Pirabrzhensky. Uh, my question is about the IAEA, and you mentioned its important role with the JCPOA. I'm just wondering if you could assess its capability to fulfill that role, and also as an international organization, how vulnerable it is it to, to politicization. Thank you. Well, okay, uh, first of all, again, I'll repeat, I think the IAEA is doing a very, very, very good job uh, in, in, in Iran, um, uh, they, uh, uh, to be honest, I think it's a, it's a, it's a heavy load for the, for the organization. Uh, uh, they have had to, uh, they have uh, a lot more boots on the ground than they ever had, supplemented 
by all the additional technologies that the JCPOA has allowed them, allowed them to employ, from cameras and seals and all kinds of, all kinds of things. So uh, in terms of their capabilities, uh, uh, I feel, I always have felt, and I feel today uh, quite confident uh, in, their, uh, in their abilities. There is <laughs> part of that confidence stems from the fact that uh, our, uh, our, I mean, our national, the DOE national laboratories, uh, uh, are, are very uh, significant participants in the training of the inspectors, uh, inspectors in, terms of, in terms of all the technologies. So I think it's a question of, um, of, of sustaining support for the, the agency. In fact, whether it's the agency or whether it is the employment of national means of, for knowing, for trying to understand what's going on, what I've sometimes said is, like, as an example, I got great news for you. We just got you 25 years of surveillance of the uranium supply chain. The bad news is you got to stick to it for 25 years. Uh, I mean, so it's, there's also, frankly, leadership issues of making sure that these issues of verification, transparency in Iran over a long time period that, that the commitment is sustained. And that's not, that's financially, but it goes beyond financially. It has to remain a priority, otherwise those verification tools will not have the intended, intended effect over time. Forgive me for embroidering on his answer, but the IAEA has been one of the most underappreciated national security assets we have. Mm -hmm. The Defense Department has failed to appreciate how important it is for us. And here I in the second row, just stand up please. Yeah, the microphone's right behind you. My name is Sok Sur Lee, a professor of Korean National Defense University. Right now, I am a visiting scholar at U.S. Korea Institute of Science, Johns Hopkins. My question is about the difference between Geneva Agreed Framework and uh, JCPOA, uh, Iran Agreement. Uh, it seems to me that Geneva Agreed Framework is so rough in terms of techniques and verifications and give and take steps and others. But uh, my sense is that, uh, you know, Iranian agreement is very technically sophisticated. You mentioned today verification process is so multi-layered and uh, uh, but technically very advanced than Geneva agreed framework. So do you have my, a question? My, do you have a my question? question is, yeah. yeah, my question is, how do you think the role of uh, uh, nuclear scientists groups role in, in nuclear negotiation? I mean, my understanding is that, uh, you know, advisory group of scientists led by you play the significant role in Iranian negotiation. Thank you. Well, um, Actually, uh, uh, my friend uh, Graham Allison uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School uh, is trying to develop a theme, relevant to your question, of so-called uh, science or scientists as diplomats. Uh, and uh, so uh, first let me say that I think the, uh, the role of science in, in negotiations has always been very important. Uh, and in fact, uh, on the JCPOA, for example, uh, I mean, I became a negotiator in parallel with the Secretary of State uh, in February 2015. But the Department of Energy was involved in those negotiations all the time because there had to be constant analysis of, of, of options, et cetera. So, you know, to be honest, then. Uh, you know, the rather unique situation that developed uh, JCPOA cast, put more of a spotlight on it, but, it, but and, and, and it was different to actually be, the, be a negotiator as opposed to a supporter for the negotiation. So, so in this particular case, uh, it, it proved to be, first of all, fortuitous uh, uh, that the quotes, heads of the nuclear programs in the two countries, uh, both uh, had the uh, requisite uh, uh, technical background, not to mention 
uh, both having MIT connections uh, was extremely helpful as well. Uh, and, uh, 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 but what I don't know, and with Graham, it's, it's, uh, Graham will be following this and thinking through, uh, are there other major negotiations where actually having appropriately trained um, and high enough political level people, scientists, doing the negotiation itself? It's not, a, it's not obvious. Uh, uh, I, I frankly just don't know whether this is a one-off or, or something that can be much more important in other domains, climate negotiations or things of the like. Well, I, I thought that gigahertz was a French car rental company. So <laughs> I, uh, I, I rather think defense guys need scientists. Right. Okay. <laughs> Third row here. Hi, Brett Kogelmas. There seems to be a lot of focus on missile technology, but what's to say North Korea hasn't already smuggled a weapon in? No, it, that's, uh, that's really important. And actually, my colleague Sam Nunn uh, may want to respond to that since this, it's a favorite theme of his, uh, that there are much more crude delivery systems. Uh, and the crude delivery systems can also develop, can also deliver uh, cruder weapons uh, because you don't have the same kinds of constraints as you're going to have for, uh, say, a long, a long range missile. So that's absolutely correct. Uh, and furthermore, uh, a uh, I don't want to get carried away with this, but, but certainly a crude delivery system may allow one to at least provide more ambiguity as to the return address. Uh, Senator, would you like to comment on this? Because I, I know this is something that you've spent a lot of time on. Uh, let's bring a microphone up to Senator on the front row, please. Well, first, I don't have any rebuttal <laughs> to Ernie's excellent speech and question and answer. I, I've been concerned about uh, delivery systems where you do not have a return address for a long time. I think we've moved into a new era where catastrophic nuclear terrorism is much more possible and that we all, all the nuclear powers, uh, no matter how much we disagree on a lot of things, have a similar box that we're in. Because I think deterrence, even if it's safe, secure, reliable, and that's what it's got to be, and survivable, as Ernie said, is not nearly enough. Uh, we are in a different era now. Uh, you've got attribution problems. You've got cyber problems. You've got possibility of simulated attacks uh, that are false. Uh, you've got uh, the whole question of protecting nuclear materials because the scientific knowledge is out there, not a piece of cake but to make a crude weapon and just imagine the dilemma if the, uh, if the North Koreans announced or any other nuclear country announced in great tension that they had a crude weapon on a ship, guess which port's it in? Or they had a nuclear weapon in a tunnel or a basement. Now, it may not be true, but how do you disprove it? And what's the reaction wherever the basement is allegedly located? So anyway, those are things we've got to consider. And I think uh, I've said a lot of times we're in a race between cooperation and catastrophe. And when I say we, I mean the nuclear powers, even those that are under considerable uh, strains now like US and Russia. There are a lot of mutual existential interest. Um, right, right over here, right next to the camera that's running. Um, yep, please stand up and identify yourself. Mm. Thank you, sir. This is Ahmed Khan from Atlantic Council. I'm a visiting fellow here. We can't hear you. Can't You're going to have to make it, put it closer to mouth. Ah, thank you. Uh, actually, I'm a visiting fellow here in Atlantic Council, and uh, I would like to draw your comments on the current devel nuclear development in South Asia. And do you really think that Pakistan has a fastest nuclear program in the world? And what do your comments on the new nuclear city development in India? Thank you, sir. Just want to make sure I understand your question. Uh, so you want to, you're talking about the nuclear power development in Southeast Asia? Oh, weapons, weapons development. development. Oh, in I Pakistan. see. In, in Pakistan and India, in particular. I see. Uh, well, I mean, Pakistan and India uh, uh, is, is a situation that is uh, one of the uh, clear cases where of of concern about this miscalculation, uh, again, broadly defined miscalculation uh, as a, a route to a 
bad outcome. Uh, the, uh, uh, we know uh, uh, about the deployment of uh, badly misnamed, I hate, hate to say it, but tactical uh, nuclear weapons, which is really a misnomer, uh, but, uh, but the idea that, uh, that battlefield use uh, uh, could come in is exactly the kind of escalation that, that we, were, we were talking about and were worried about. The, uh, I might just add that, uh, that that's not the only case in Pakistan and India, uh, but in many of the cases that are of concern, Frankly, we are, we are talking about situations of asymmetric conventional military capabilities. Uh, and that ends up providing uh, often a lot of the impetus. I might add uh, that uh, uh, one might say that at the height of the Cold War, the shoe was in some sense on the other foot, as we had our concerns uh, in, um, uh, with the Iron Curtain. Uh, and uh, mechanized uh, units are, are rolling over. So, so I think that reinforces the point made in the Korea context that I think a lot, a lot of these discussions focus too much only on the nuclear threat and not on the overall security context, which often is driving the possible instability. Okay, we've got time for uh, right in the back, and, and you're going to get the benediction. Hi, I'm Amy Roma at Hogan Levels. Um, maybe just shifting over to the Middle East, what are your thoughts on a potential U.S.-Saudi uh, bilateral agreement for nuclear cooperation without the so-called gold standard with the prohibition on enrichment and reprocessing, particularly in light of the difficulty that the U.S. has competing in the international market against the Russian and the Chinese? <laughs> Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, look, obviously we've seen the reports that, uh, that there are discussions going on for a one, two, three agreement, a peaceful uses agreement with Saudi Arabia that uh, will not have all of the features of the gold standard so-called that the Emirates have signed up for. So number one, I think we have to, first of all, give great credit to the Emirates and their posture in the non-proliferation world. I might add, uh, again, a little bit of, of uh, home advertising, that uh, the LEU bank uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, Sam Dunn was uh, very instrumental in, NTI catalyzed, uh, that the Emirates were one of the countries that uh, provided funds uh, to, uh, uh, to, to build the, the LEU bank. They have the gold standard. So again, I think they deserve a tremendous amount of credit uh, for, for what they are doing and hopefully will do in this context. Now, we've known for a long time, uh, certainly in the Middle East, uh, and it's not just Saudi Arabia. Uh, I mean, I can say, I think I can say, I was involved in these discussions years ago uh, with Jordan, uh, there are issues with Egypt, uh, et cetera, that they have said, we have no intention of developing these fuel cycle facilities, but we're not prepared to write this off in perpetuity. So my argument would be is, look, why don't we focus on what we're trying to get at and think creatively about how to do that. So uh, a paper that I was uh, uh, an author uh, on some years ago with uh, Dan Poneman, uh, who was member of the Scowcroft group at the time, uh, Arnie Cantor, another member of the Scowcroft group at the time, and John Deutsch. So for example, we said, look, one way to look at this is you could provide special fuel cycle services to a country for a contracted period of time, during which period they would not do enrichment or reprocessing. That's just one, that's just one example. So, uh, you know, you basically, it's like a time-limited gold standard uh, in, in a sense. But it gets around uh, some of the issues of, quotes, permanently rejecting your future opportunities. With that, I think there comes other incentives uh, that, that, one, that one could, one could uh, 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 put in. For example, in our paper, we had the idea that uh, we could support their participation, the third country's participation in, in a, a real 
nuclear, let's say, advanced nuclear reactor development program. Not enrichment, not reprocessing. But that would be fine. So, you know, th I think there's a whole bunch of ways of packaging this that can accomplish the goal, even if it's not a, quotes, gold standard uh, one, two, three agreement. And, and I would just end by reinforcing what I said earlier, and the CSIS commission of 2012, I think it was, 2012, yeah. 2013, uh, did that, and we, have, we published a paper last year that uh, I do believe it is very important for the United States to try to a rebuild, certainly preserve, and rebuild our nuclear supply chain. Uh, that was the foundation of our being able to shape the nonproliferation regime so effectively. And let's face it, uh, we're not in great shape uh, already. It's going to get a lot worse if we're frozen out of enormous regions of the world, like the Middle East, where Russia has at least uh, tentative uh, or some form of, of contracts uh, uh, with, well, uh, with Iran, of course, they're building the Iran reactors, with Egypt, with Saudi Arabia, with Jordan, with Turkey. So, um, uh, so I, I think we have, you have to look at this in a multidimensional way uh, to, to achieve our overall security objectives. I would just say, too, we, we've got about 210 nuclear reactors in America. Half of them are on land powering cities, and half of them are in nuclear ship, or ships, American Navy ships. It's going to be a hell of a lot harder to support our Navy if our commercial nuclear sure. sector goes down. So. Yeah, in fact, I mean, I just add, add to that, John, that the, uh, so uh, I, I think a key issue on the, on the nuclear supply chain is the, is the nonproliferation position. Uh, that uh, we, we need to be sustained. But as John said, there are a variety of national security needs that are either hard to sustain, like the, mm -hmm. the, the small modular reactors that are deployed on, on yep. ships, on, ships. on the water and under the water, uh, but also we cannot meet we do not have the capability today to meet our needs for fuel for those reactors, nor for producing the tritium that we need in our stockpile. We are living off of stockpiles yep. that are sitting in the closet right now. That cannot go on forever. We should be... And for these purposes, for national security purposes, we need American technology. Right. The clock is ticking. Yep. Yep. Forgive me, I'm gonna abuse my privilege yep. to ask one last question, or and that is the, the, the national security strategy that came out a couple of weeks ago. Did, it had some reference to cross-domain deterrence. So the question is, is it plausible to deter nuclear weapons by threatening a cyber attack on somebody? And conversely, is it plausible to threaten nuclear retaliation if somebody does a cyber attack on us? Is any of that plausible? Well, it was certainly in the national security strategy. Um, uh, the, um, uh, as I said in my remarks, first of all, the entire broadening of the landscape for nuclear deterrence uh, is, I think is a very, very fundamental uh, step in the wrong direction, a really bad one. Uh, and it had, it had conventional things, then it had cyber. Now cyber has its own special challenges. Uh, 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 and, uh, and, and I must say, we. On cyber, first of all, having read only the unclassified uh, Defense Science Board reports on cyber and nuclear command and control uh, did not leave one feeling comfortable about what might be in the classified <laughs> uh, part of it, although I haven't read it, so I don't know. Uh, uh, but I think the idea of, of, uh, of nuclear deterrence of cyber attacks broadly certainly is, does not make any sense. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, but that's where we need to have discussions, and they're going to, and they're going to be very, very tough, probably initially with Russia, but uh, ultimately it's got to be broader than that, mm -hmm. about what is com some kind of cyber hygiene uh, in the nuclear command and control world, uh, because uh, uh, this is really dangerous. And, of course, a real concern is that, let's say between okay, U.S. and Russia, it could be a third party doing the cyber deception. Uh, that's, and, right. that's very risky. Yeah, it's, it's very, very, very risky. Dangerous. And so, so uh, we, uh, again, at NTI, we are, we are gearing up a program. It's been going on for, at some level, for about a year and a half, uh, gearing it up now. Um, uh, uh, it's a critical problem. Uh, colleagues, um, Ernie's speech is going to be available tomorrow at the NTI website. Uh, tomorrow? Is it tomorrow? You okay. promise? Okay, tomorrow it'll be up. Uh, it'll be even I, longer, even longer. <laughs> an even longer version. <laughs> I hope you'll give us permission to put it up here. We would okay, like sure. to be able to feature it here as well, but you, of course, have first rights. Uh, so go to this, because I, I couldn't take notes fast enough, but go take a look at it tomorrow. It was very powerful. Ernie, thank you for this. It was thank very, you, John, very helpful. We do have a reception outside, so please follow okay. up. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.